The idea that one can tell where in Ireland a fiddle player comes from simply by listening to the way they play is an attractive one. From the listener's point of view, it's a way to demonstrate the depth of your experience and knowledge on the subject. For the player, it shows the authenticity of the performance rooted in the geography and history of the country. And for the proponents of Irish music as a whole, it clearly illustrates the richness and diversity of the unbroken tradition. However, the concept of regional style is a controversial one, which some regard as simplistic at best and a cheap marketing ploy at worst. I'll be looking first at the question of what constitutes style in fiddle playing and describe the characteristics of style in different parts of Ireland. I'll then look at some of the questions that have been raised about the orthodox view of regional styles and suggestions that it may all be a 20th century invention. I'll look at the pressures which may have eroded regional style and finally look at what the future may hold. If you've ever had the pleasure of seeing a classical violinist attempting to play an Irish jig, you'll be aware that there's more to the music than just the notes that you might find on the page. There are many details of performance which are all in their own way different interpretations of the basic tune. Such details include ornamentation, bowing, phrasing, articulation, intonation and tempo. There is also choice of repertoire. Of the thousands of tunes available, each player will regularly play only a small fraction. Irish traditional music as we know it was mostly created in the 18th and 19th centuries in a rural setting where most of the population travelled no more than a few miles from their home village. Music was learnt by ear, mostly from parents, family or friends. The elements of style outlined above were therefore passed down the generations with relatively little change or innovation. With no mass media, a player on one side of Ireland was unlikely to experience the style played on the other side of the country. The only regular medium for mixing of style and repertoire was the dancing master or the few travelling musicians who made a living doing a circuit, playing for dancers and teaching in people's houses, and even these individuals would have been relatively localised in their travels. It's no surprise that local factors such as the preference for particular dancers, the influence of particular gifted individuals or the presence of outside influences would lead to a differentiation of style around the country. Whilst in one village the fiddlers might play reels at a particular tempo, on the other side of the hill they might play them slower. A parallel is often drawn with spoken dialect, which, at least until late in the 20th century, formed a rich mosaic of distinctive forms of speech across the whole of the British Isles. In Ireland this analogy breaks down somewhat, in that distinct fiddle styles can only be recognised in certain parts of the country. For historical reasons there is little in the way of fiddle tradition in the east of Ireland. If there is such a thing as a Wicklow, Meath or Kildare style, I've yet to hear of it. It's in the rural south, west and northwest corners of Ireland where Gaelic traditional culture survived best. So let's look at some of these regional fiddle styles. County Clare on the west coast certainly has one of the strongest fiddle traditions. It is marketed to foreigners as the home of traditional music and Doolin and Ennis are the two top destinations for musical tourists. Clare fiddlers are noted for slower tempos, a relaxed, lyrical feel, fluid bowing and the use of lots of rolls and a favouring of lower, darker sounding keys such as G, G minor, C and D minor. Fiddlers often tune the whole fiddle down to emphasise the deeper tone. Sensitive dynamics, a rare feature in traditional music, are also heard. A particular feature of Clare fiddling is what is often called a lonesome touch. This is a combination of frequent sliding up to notes and a distinctive use of the untempered scale with neutral thirds and sevenths. This feature is best heard in the playing of Paddy Canny on his album Paddy Canny Traditional Music from the legendary East Clare Fiddler. Canny is often spoken of as the epitome of East Clare Fiddle. Canny in turn influenced one of the stars of the current Irish scene, Martin Hayes. Martin is the son of P.J. Hayes, and before moving to the U.S., he played in his youth in the Tuller Cayley Band. Like Canny, Martin Hayes has developed his own style, incorporating elements of local style along with outside influences. Long bows and smooth rolls are a feature of his style, and Hayes has developed a trademark double roll, which you can hear, for example, on The Morning Star from his 1992 Martin Hayes album. Careful and deliberate slides up to notes, and sometimes the flattening of a note to give an almost blues effect can be heard throughout his playing. If Hayes and Canny represent the East Clare style, some also recognise a West Clare style, as seen in the playing of Bobby Casey, Junior Crean, Patrick Kelly and John Kelly. Donegal, on the northwest coast, has one of Ireland's most distinctive fiddle styles. The principal reason for this is its frequent contact with Scotland, particularly with Donegal agricultural workers crossing the sea for the Scottish potato harvest. 
This influence is clear in the repertoire, which contains tune types such as Strathspeys, Highlands, Germans and Mazurkas, all rarely seen further south. Echoes of the Highland bagpipes are heard in the frequent use of bowed triplets or trebles, and in the abundance of tunes in A. Being played in the upper strings, this contributes to a bright sound overall. Brisk tempos, a fierce attack, and the use of many separate bows are also features commonly associated with Donegal fiddling. The musician most often associated with Donegal fiddle is the traveller and tinsmith John Doherty, who could trace his musical ancestors back to the flight of the Earls in 1607. Doherty's overall style certainly sometimes fits the stereotype with regard to bowing. He used powerful separate staccato, even bows, but also had very sophisticated and highly original bowing techniques such as the floating bow, after which his best-known album is named. There were also many distinctive features to his playing. His ability to use high positions and difficult keys, his use of scordatura for uncanny bagpipe imitations, and his technique of feathering, a type of vibrato produced by vibration of the bow rather than the left hand. He sometimes used a spiccato bouncing bow. Other Donegal fiddlers include one-time Bothy band member Tommy Peoples, regarded as the master of the bow treble, but so distinctive in the density of his ornamentation that he's rarely regarded as a representative of the Donegal style. Mairead Namuni of the band Altan has also done much to popularise the distinctive Donegal repertoire. Down in the southwest lies the Sleeve Lucre, an area of Kerry, Limerick and North Cork, lying in a triangle between Ballydesmond, Rathmore and Castle Island. The repertoire of this area is particularly distinctive, with a great number of polkas and slides. This relates directly to the popularity of dancers using these tunes. Open string drones are common among fiddlers, as is doubling, where two fiddlers play a melody in unison octaves. The tunes are relatively unornamented. Padrego O'Keefe was a significant player and teacher. Among his pupils were Dennis Murphy and Julia Clifford, who together recorded what many regard as the definitive Sleeve Lucre album, Star Above the Garter, in 1968. One of the best contemporary fiddlers in this style is Matt Cranich of the band Sleeve Notes, known not only for his fine playing but also his fiddle books. He is particularly well known for his playing of slow airs, another common feature of the region. Another region said to have a distinctive fiddle style is Sligo, described as being bouncy and full of lift, the most noted exponents being the great Michael Coleman, who, along with others such as James Morrison and Paddy Caloran, took the boat to America in the early 20th century and featured on highly influential recordings. Kevin Burke is regarded as a current exponent of the style. So far so good. The fiddle styles we've described are well documented and their descriptions frequently appear in print, not least on the sleeve notes and promotional material of touring artists. However, there is also a constant rumbling of discontent from critics who say that regional style is an entirely modern invention and that, if it ever really existed, it is now maintained artificially. One problem is that until the broadcaster Sean O'Reader proposed the idea in his Our Musical Heritage series in 1962, no one had even noticed that such a thing existed. Francis O'Neill's Irish Minstrels and Their Music, published in 1913, a wide-ranging and detailed look at traditional music in Ireland, made no mention of regional variation. The association between folk tradition and the regions within a country is well established throughout Europe. It's a popular idea with the public, especially with people aiming to promote the attractiveness and distinctiveness of their region, and among urban dwellers and expatriates who look with nostalgia on the rural area from which their parents came. Regionalism and Folklore is a study by David Hopkin. In it he stated, Migrants created a market for regional traditions, and regional identity is performed for visitors so that they can authentically experience what it means to be somewhere different. The argument is not whether these traditions exist and are genuinely tied to their local landscape, but rather that the choice of a particular geographical area as being the exclusive locale for that tradition is an idea more driven by romantic ideals than by demonstrable observation. To quote another paper by David Kearney, the persistent preoccupation with a regional discourse in Irish traditional music that gazes nostalgically into a pristine rural past continues to distort understanding of the reality of cultural practice. In France, following the Paris riots in 1968, there was a great upsurge in interest in the traditional music of the French regions, such as Auvergne and Brittany. But the French regions are huge in comparison to the counties of Ireland. Does a fiddle style cover a region 100 miles across, a county 30 miles across, or a town, or a village? It has also proved remarkably difficult to go beyond broad, sweeping generalisations and give precise descriptions of individual styles or their geographical boundaries. On the one hand, the delineation of Donegal as a musical region is undermined when numerous local subdivisions are postulated. 
On the other hand, the borders of sleeve lucre seem to have mysteriously expanded as the style has become increasingly popular in recent years. It's easy to point to a key player such as John Doherty and say that he represents Donegal, but it's equally easy to find a dozen other players from the same area who sound nothing like him. If we assume that these outstanding players and travelling musicians are the ones who establish and develop a style within a region, it's reasonable to suggest that in the absence of widespread travel among the rural populace, style might develop differently in different areas. However, let's say that a particular fiddler lives in Clare, but close to the border with Galway. He's as likely to travel into Galway as he is to the other side of Clare, so how is his influence going to contribute to a distinctive Clare style? No one would deny that in past years Ireland must have been a patchwork or mosaic of different musical traditions, but to claim that county boundaries could be used to differentiate distinct styles must at least be open to question. Sally K. Summer-Smith in 1997 suggested that regional differentiation, far from being as old as the hills, did not begin until the second half of the 19th century. Until the potato famine, there was sufficient population and movement for there to be a continuity of musical culture throughout the country, any variations were gradual over the full width of the country, rather than falling into distinct regions. It was the depopulation caused by the potato famine which, according to Smith, caused musical styles to shrink into separated areas. This gives little more than half a century before new factors began to remove forever the conditions which had created these local or regional variations. <laughs> So, if we accept that there was once wide geographic variation in musical style, what were the forces in the 20th century which threatened that variation? The recordings of Michael Coleman in the 1920s had a huge effect on the remaining traditional musicians of Ireland. The most positive was the inspiration they gave to fiddlers, many of whom spent hours playing them over and over again in order to learn the fine detail of his ornamentation and variation. However, Coleman is often cited as the man who destroyed regional style. His own bouncy, highly ornamented playing, roughly representative of Sligo, was suddenly the only style anyone wanted to hear or learn. It became the basis of a new national style. The spread of radio and gramophone recordings and improvements in travel began to reduce the cultural isolation of rural Ireland, while the Public Dance Hall Act of 1935 and the spread of Cayley bands with their regimented and metronomic sound were further nails in the coffin for regional variation. The 1950s and 60s saw the beginning of a revival. Kyoltus was formed in 1951 as a society to preserve and promote traditional music. They began organising festivals or flowers, an important feature of which was a series of contests for singers, dancers and instrumentalists. The FLA has become an international institution with over 20,000 people competing every year. Performances are marked by a panel of judges and one of their key criteria is strict adherence to traditional style. The big question is, what style? How do you compare the fierce driven bow of a Tommy Doherty with the smooth meditative lyricism of a Martin Hayes? The chief and very frequently voiced criticism of Kyoltus is that they have created a national FLA style which excludes any trace of regional style along with innovation and creativity. Although Hayes carried off the All Island twice, he did so by playing straight down the line, rather than by demonstrating the genius of his personal style. Kyoto's style is variously described as homogeneous, bland and generic. The folk revival as a whole has been an urban rather than a rural phenomenon, with musicians travelling long distances to meet and play together. One side effect of the creation of the FLA was the spread of the traditional pub session in Ireland, a phenomenon which previously had been mostly seen in London. Sessions, while accepting a degree of cacophony, are ideally about playing together. Variations in tempo, intonation, key or setting are all unhelpful to say the least in a session environment. In London, the US or elsewhere where sessions happen, there's no chance that the players will be from the same part of Ireland. If they are of Irish descent, they will probably represent a number of different counties, and many of them will probably have no Irish links at all. This leads to not merely a national, but an international style. For most musicians learning in the 21st century, the old idea of learning from your parents and neighbours is dead in the water. Apart from sessions, there are CDs, radio broadcasts, YouTube clips, touring bands, workshops and tutorial books. These are the sources from which people learn their fiddle style today. So how, in the current environment, can any vestige of regional style survive? The fact is that as soon as O'Reilly came up with the idea in the 1950s, it was a winner. As with any form of folk music, it's not just the music itself that people find attractive. Taken in isolation, it's meaningless. Like the tango with dockside Buenos Aires, hot club jazz with pre-war Paris, or old-time music with the backwards of Appalachia, 
Irish traditional music is forever tied in the mind to a sentimental picture of the lost lifestyle of rural Ireland. Identity, authenticity, continuity, a sense of time and place, these are all essential concepts to anyone who is a serious performer of Irish music. You will scarcely hear a concert or read a CD inlay without hearing that the performer learnt this tune from Paddy O'Sullivan of County Clare or Johnny McSweeney, whose mother got it from, well, you get the picture. The concept of regional style is a way of tying the music, the performance, the tune, to a particular place in Ireland rather than just being from Ireland or from O'Neill's. So, as the revival has continued into the 21st century, regional style has become an essential part of the packaging and marketing of Irish music. Altan is as firmly tied to Donegal as sleeve notes are to sleeve lucre, or Martin Hayes to East Clare. Regional style has reinvented itself. It's no longer propagated by isolation and one-to-one transmission. Today, the music of Clare is taught to people from all over the world at the Willie Clancy Summer School in Ennis or at the Bog Hill Centre in Kilfenora. It is heard and learnt by people anywhere who might never have been to Ireland in their lives. Anyone who goes on the journey of learning this music will start out regarding it as a single homogeneous genre, but if they stick at it, they will almost inevitably begin to delve into the finer detail and exquisite nuance of particular localities. Whether or not it existed in the past, and despite all the forces lined up against it, Regional style is here to stay. <laughs>